Hello! Hey y'all! How y'all doing tonight? Welcome to the CPR and Yebo storytelling event. Tonight is a very beautiful night. Yes! That's Isaura Ibarra. She's one of the educators at Yebo, the youth empowerment broadcasting organization. Before we do get started, we do have a tradition here at Yebo, and our students know. But if you don't know, let me let me run it for you a little bit. We do this thing. Yebo in Zulu means hell yeah. So I'm just going to do a real quick call out. Ayo. Yebo. Okay, we see you. We hear y'all. We love it. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Yebo is an education program that offers young people the opportunity to develop new skills and explore digital media at Empower Community High School a small charter school in Aurora. When Yebo invited me into their space, I jumped at the opportunity. It was like a home away from home, to be around students from immigrant and refugee families, learning about their lives and the stories they tell. Welcome to My Story So Far, the storytelling podcast that brings you voices from the plains, the peaks, the valleys, and the hidden corners of Colorado. I'm your host, Luis Antonio Perez. In this episode, you'll hear from the students and educators of Yebo. Get ready for stories about Taekwondo, Christmas dinners, favorite dishes from grandma, and haircuts with dad. Yebo was founded to help young people be more mindful of how they're interacting with digital media. I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time at Yebo over the past year. The thing I loved most about visiting with Yebo was seeing how the educators and the students were developing a culture of support for each other in real time. It was so uplifting to experience. We held this storytelling event in Yebo space at Empower High. The folks at Yebo shared stories about two of the most important things in the world, family and love. Our first story comes from Godwin Amuzu, former Empower student and Yebo's competitive gaming team coach. Godwin's story is about love and the indomitable spirit. Yeah, my name is Godwin Amuzu on the streets. They call me the genie. They also call me Young Jolof. Back in my heyday, they would call me the kid. So if you ever see me on the streets, you know what to call me. Uh, <laughs> no, but I will tell you a story uh, from when I was a kid. I think it was like fourth or fifth grade. I'm sitting in class. and I was really quiet, super focused, very studious. I think we were doing some like poetry assignment. And our teacher is handing out uh, these flyers. So she slaps one on my desk, and I pick it up, and it's a fly for Taekwondo. And I get super ecstatic because my older brothers, they loved martial arts films, and so I always would watch it with them. Uh, like some of my favorite films are like Ip Man, The Way of the Dragon, any Bruce Lee film, really. Rush Hour 1, 2, and 3. Shout out, Jaden. <laughs> Me and you. Uh, and like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So anything with martial arts fighting in it, I, I loved it. And so when I seen this fly, I go to my parents, and they ain't never seen me this passionate. The same passion that you see from me right now. That's how I sounded as a kid. And they locked me in and they're like, okay, we'll take you to check it out. We pull up to the Dojang, and I felt like Jaden Smith version two in the making. Uh, you can tell, like, yo, this is legit. You walk in, and the floor, it's a, it's a soft mat, alternating red, blue, just like the Olympics. On the right-hand side, uh, it's this mural wall, red, blue, and yellow graffiti art with this giant black silhouette to win a flying sidekick. And on the very top, in big black bold letters, are the five tenets of Taekwondo. Integrity, courtesy, self-control, perseverance, and indomitable spirit. On the other side, this is a giant mirror wall. Uh, it's super tall, super long. It takes up most of the wall. And above that are the rankings of the belts, all the way from white belt to black belt. And in the corners are these kicking pads and punching pads. So I, I see all of this, and I'm like, "Woo! I'm about to meet my Jackie Chan. Wax on, wax off. We about to be legit. And so I get my white belt, I get my white gi, and I suit up like this is the Avengers protocol for my first class. So first class, they line us up facing the mirror wall. And I was an insecure little kid, so I couldn't bear to look at myself in the mirror. But I did look at the three other students adjacent to me. And there was this girl at the end that particularly caught my attention. D is her name, at least what she's going by for this purpose. 
She was cute. She was cute. <laughs> and she caught my attention throughout the entire class. Uh, it was the flutter of her gi, the strength in her kicks, the calmness in her form. You could tell, like, she lived and breathed this art. Like, all of those tenets, you can tell that she embodied those. And we are all white belts in this, but you can tell this is the life that she was trying to live. And I could tell that I was trying to stay in Taekwondo for as long as she was there. <laughs> I had a little crush. Uh, you know, I had felt butterflies before, but I ain't never felt them like this. It was like they were filming a kung fu movie in my stomach. So, like my favorite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, Donatello, I was a man with a plan. Uh, and I had this crush. And I, to get her to notice me, I was like, all right, let me just get great at Taekwondo. I get so good, she'll have to fall in love with me, right? Well, also like Donatello, I fold under pressure. And every time I saw her, all I felt was pressure. When I saw her, it was like Spring was searching for the perfect subject to compliment. And D fit that image perfectly. You know, like harps and doves would start flying in. And like violins would be playing in the background. And like spring flowers would encroach on the edges of my vision. Like, yeah, it was a real crush. And so for like three years, like white belt to brown belt, We are in the same class. Because the way that you rank up, you all get offered the test at the same time, and we would all pass. And so from white belt to yellow belt, from yellow belt to purple belt, from purple to brown, we are always in the same class. And I could not talk to this girl, so I was just focused on getting great. Uh, And it's interesting. You start to build a familial bond with these people. I mean, that's three years. Issue is, I'm not trying to build a familial bond with my crush. I don't want her to be my sister. So stuck to the plan. Don't talk. Just get great. And there was this one time that felt like a testament to that. So the way that testing works is our master seats us down and he goes into the back to grab these papers. And usually how it goes is he come back with the papers and he'll call us up one by one. Well, this time he goes into the back. And when he comes out, he has one paper in his hand. That ain't never happened before. (laughs) And I I told you about pressure before, how I felt pressure. Let me tell you how this felt. It felt like the room was crushing and we were getting pulled downwards. My head was falling. My shoulders were slipping. My heart, it wasn't even my stomach. It was in a fruit bowl with Hades and the underworld. That's how much pressure I felt. And everybody in the room felt it. And so he, he has the one paper in his hand and he says this. In accordance to the World Taekwondo Federation and Kuki Wan, the above named person will be testing for the red belt promotion. Silence. You can hear a pin drop. And then he says the name Godwin Amuzu. <laughs> hey, these, can I get my heart back, please? <laughs> I'm ecstatic just thinking about it right now. Yo, I was so hype. And you're supposed to be super disciplined in Taekwondo. But I remember when he said my name, I could have sworn I jumped up and I had a bit of a strut to my walk. So I go up there, I grab my paper, I say, thank you, Master Johnson. And as I'm turning around, I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is my moment. I am finally great. D is going to fall in love with me. It's going to be dope. Turn around, scan the room. It was nothing but sadness on everybody's face. And of course it was. No, nobody else was testing. And I look at D, and it's, it's sadness, it's disappointment. But then, like a flick of a switch, it turns into determination. Her motivation was undeniable. And I think I might have fallen in love just a little bit more. <laughs> so I go do the test. I completed it. I pass. And when you pass, you get to go to this ceremony where everybody who's done their test gets to uh, grab their belts and celebrate. And at the ceremony, usually what happens is uh, I'll grab my belt from the master, shake hands, and I'll look to my left, I'll look to my right to acknowledge, you know, everybody that I did this with. But this time, they weren't there. So I grab my belt, and instead of looking to my left and my right, I look into the mirror wall for the first time. And I saw someone I ain't never seen before. It was someone who practiced courtesy, integrity, self-control, perseverance, and indomitable spirit. I had the same look on my face that D had. And it was in that moment I realized this is the first time that I've really seen myself. And the reason that I liked D so much was because she was everything that I wanted to be. Well, 
I got my red belt. And when you get your red belt, you also get a red gi. And we do a little celebration at the end. Red gi, red belt. I was dripped out. I felt tight. I felt like the man of the town. So music is bumping. We got foods. I'm down in Capri Suns left and right. It was super dope. Everybody's congratulating each other. And D comes up to me. And you can cue the same scene. Spring flowers encroaching in. Doves are flying in. It felt like Shrek the musical. Like dope music was playing. Harps and violins. And she congratulates me. And I say, well, thank you. And in that moment, there were only butterflies in her hair, none in my stomach. I felt confident. And so we actually talked and I learned, like, oh, this girl's like a model. She's doing dope things in middle school. She's super religious. I learned all these things about her, and it was, it was super dope. I got to know her as a friend. So I wish I could tell you at the end it was me and her, and we got together, and I became a master at Taekwondo, but neither of those things are true. I didn't have the courage to ask her out, but I did have this new courage to go pursue something for me and pursue something passionately with the same confidence that I had felt when I looked in that mirror wall. So I quit Taekwondo after getting my black belt, and I go and do poetry, and I go do a spoken word, and I go and do musical theater, and I do all these performances, and every time I get up on the stage nowadays, I... Think about self-control, I think about integrity, courtesy, perseverance, and especially indomitable spirit. To do something with like pure passion. So the karate kid with the kid didn't end the way that I thought it would, but I feel like I got something a little better. Thank you. Thank you, Godwin, for reminding us about an important life lesson, one that the great Arthur Ashe describes so succinctly when he said, the doing is often more important than the outcome. Our next story is from Bella, a student at Yebo who's deeply into video game development. Bella's story is about family and how the most important things in life don't always have to be the hardest. Oh my god, hi Eric. Hi guys. Um, <laughs> my name is Bella. Um, this is um, essentially a story of my first Christmas with my father. <sighs> okay, so I'm obviously still a kid. I am still very much so a child. Not 18 yet, but when I was a much younger me, a child, um, we used to go to either my grandparents' house or we used to host Christmas. And this is very important. So. There, used, there were three things at Christmas every year, no doubt. I always looked forward to these three things. Enchiladas, tamales, arroz rojo. And my family was in charge of making enchiladas. So um, around a week before, my mom, she would plan everything out for Christmas. She would have us wrap the gifts like a month before. She knew what she was going to wear. She knew what we were going to wear. She knew what in- ingredients we need for the enchiladas. Like she would literally write down a whole list, even though we, that was our recipe. We know the enchiladas. So my mom, she's very straight cut. You know, she plans everything out to the T. And it's actually very interesting because my father is not like that at all. He's the complete opposite of that, which made it very interesting to live with my father because in 2019, my parents divorced after like a long separation process. Um, and you know, when you get divorced, you have to make a schedule with the courts, you know, co-parenting, it's a big deal, I guess. So my parents' schedule for the holidays was that they would rotate every year. She would get us for Christmas Eve and then my dad would get us for Christmas day. So my dad is a very spontaneous person. He doesn't like to plan things very well. So about i want to say 2 days before christmas eve dinner the most the most important dinner in our family he had no idea what he was going to make no idea at all so of course the pressure was on he rushed us to the stores we went to safeway king supers walmart god walmart is hell <laughs> y'all know y'all know walmart on during the holidays that's just a mess <laughs> um, so 2 days before christmas Stuff was out of stock. So we were just getting everything we could, just the scraps of what all the people left over for us. So I had no idea what my dad was going to plan, but I did have faith in him. So December 24th rolls around. We do all of our Christmas traditions. You know, we like to open gifts early at my dad's house. We never wait. And then 
Of course, we have to, have to, have to watch our favorite Christmas movie. Y'all ready for this? Y'all ready for this? The best Christmas movie out there is Die Hard. 100%, Die Hard number one, Die Hard number one. It's the best Christmas movie. Love Bruce Willis, he's an icon. So imagine me and my siblings in the living room, a very small living room in his two bedroom apartment. I'm sitting on the floor with my bed to the couch because I'm too cool to sit on the couch. Um, and my dad's, you know, finishing up his meal. He's, you know, finishing up sides and everything. We're just, I'm looking over, I'm waiting for him to call me over to the table because like, I'm kind of hungry, you know? Um, so when he calls us over, we all, we gather around. You know, there's a roast in the center. There's some mac and cheese, mashed potatoes, corn, some fixins here and there, you know, a, some, some zero lemonade, some iced tea, that kind of stuff. And I look up at my dad waiting for him to tell us something, you know, because that's what you do. You wait for your parents out of respect. I look at up and, and he's, he's just, he looks so sad and nervous because this is his first Christmas with us and and he looks up at us and he looks around and he's like, I'm sorry guys, I know that this is a sorry meal, but I tried my best. And that like honestly broke my heart just to hear my father say that. Um, and I look back on that day because I remember um, that that was kind of like, not the first, but the most memorable moment with him um, that showed that he actually cared for his kids and that he would fight for us and give us the best experiences he possibly could. Um, and it's definitely like, I don't want to bash my father's cooking, but it wasn't something I was used to. It was, there was no enchiladas, there was no rice, not even any beans. Like, come on, like you just gotta put them in the, in the slow cooker, that's all you gotta do. Um, but I, I understand, I understand, you know, it's my father, you know. He's not, he's, yeah. <laughs> um, I told him that we would eat it anyways. We're not, we're not really picky, you know. Um, and that I was just, I was really happy just to be able to spend that moment with him. And that was one of the lessons that I learned is that the experiences don't change how you feel about people. They just make your feelings possibly stronger. And that's definitely what happened with me and my father. I cherish my father so much for that. Um, so I learned that Spending time with your family is more important than the experience itself. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bella, for that story and the reminder to call my own culinarily challenged dad. After the break, we'll hear two more stories about the memories we make and the love we share with family. Hi, I'm Emily Williams. I'm one of the producers who work behind the scenes to help bring you my story so far. Our team makes this show because we want listeners to hear these stories. First person, unfiltered, live storytelling. Coloradans sharing their experiences on stage for the first time ever. And we want to spread the word. So could you help us out? If you know someone who might like this podcast, please take a minute and share it with them. If you know two people, even better. Thanks for listening, sharing, and helping more people discover my story so far. This is my story so far, and we're hearing stories from the students and educators of Yebo in Aurora, Colorado. Our next story comes from Salem, who had just returned from campus visits to historically black colleges and universities. In Salem's family, their favorite winter dish is so good that for Salem's grandpa, one taste just wasn't enough. Hey y'all, my, my story is about some food. For a little bit of context, uh, so everyone here has watched Gremlins, right? Yeah, so, and the people in my story is my grandparents around the time of my life of around six, seven years old, and, and then my grandfather, uh, my grandpa, and then my grandmother, Paca, so if you hear me use Paca, that's my grandma. And <laughs> um, those two were like polar opposites. They were like two sides of the coin. Um, uh, she was like the Candyland queen, and he was like the licorice king in the game. And I loved 
that part of their relationship. And you know how you're not supposed to feed gremlins after midnight? My grandpa was like, here's a lollipop, kiddo. Uh, he, he, he enabled my flame. He was my bad influence and my grandma was my good influence. So it was the first two weeks of December. And everybody knows... You get the warm, hot, delicious dishes around the time of winter. And it's so funny. Every time I tell this story, I'm about to get this dish. So um, uh, it's chili. It's my grandma's chili. And it's so the way my grandma cooks it. It's just so good. So I was six, seven years old. And my grandma was like, I want you to help me make it. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I was a little gremlin. I was I was so hyper. So I was literally jumping up and down while she was like grabbing all of the like ingredients. And I was so excited because that was my favorite dish in the end of winter se- season. I, I literally ate leftovers for four days straight after. And I made sure there was leftovers because I knew I wanted it for lunch, dinner, and breakfast. So um, to get really into it, so imagine you walk into my house. Front door's right here. The basement door is literally right there. And then you got the uh, living room and the kitchen and the sliding door that divides it. And when my grandma cooks chili, the door is always open. So you can see right into the living room and the living room can see right into the kitchen. Um, Around this time, my grandpa is actually preparing for like the Star Trek um, marathon. And the best part about it is that man was glued to his recliner. So and, and it was perfectly placed near the kitchen. And my grandma brings out that big old pot that you have in the kitchen for like some reason like everyone has at least one of them and she already got the meat like me- um like separated she got the beans already like prepared and where she's putting it in and the first time she opened that lid and it was sizzling mm, imagine the sweet intoxicating aroma of beans and meat for my carnival lovers up in here get that ground beef up in your nostrils it, it was savory you know what i mean because the thing is my grandma couldn't handle spice so we had chili without spice so it was, it was more sweeter than anything because she added sugar to the chili and it hits you right in the face. And it's like a sweet, fresh kiss when you get into the sauna. And you like type feel, you know, get, get the feeling, get the feeling. And a little fun fact, because how we love sweetness, we added ketchup in our chili. And we still do. And I know everyone got their little things. We got the little things that everyone's like, that's weird. Why you put that in your food? And it's normal, okay? Ketchup in our chili with that two-alarm chili from King Supers down the block is delicious. And... By the way, this little kid is just doing this on the ladder while stirring. Mm-hmm. Like a little, a little dance, you know what I mean? And so it was like such a lovely experience because um, that's like the peak of like my, uh, of me getting to see my gra- grandparents' um, dynamic I and mean, like how much they loved each other. And it was, it was the most uh, incredible thing because right when we finished that chili, my, my, <laughs> my grandma was like, okay, since you helped me cook, you get the first bowl. And so my grandpa's like, hey, come over here. And I'm like, huh? And he's like, when your grandma finished the chili, get a second ball. <laughs> so what had happened was my grandpa starts like bickering with my grandma. And he's like, Sharon, let the kid get the food already. And they start talking and they're going back and forth. And it's really cute. And my grandpa, I realized he, that was his single. Get the chili. <laughs> get the, the objective is locked in. I have very light feet, so no one can hear me if I'm pulling up from behind. So I get the bowls and I grab the second bowl. My grandma, she don't know I got the second bowls on hand. So once my grandpa realizes I got the food, he stops bickering. And she's like, okay, whatever, Mark. (laughs) I'm gonna go get my food. And I slide over the bowls when my grandma's making her bowls and he's like, mission complete. And then by the way, this man gave me food Anytime I like did some stuff like candy or pop tarts, um, and so that same night I got like some lollipops, so that was great. And I enjoyed my the rest of that Star Trek marathon with my grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and it was it was an amazing night, and that was the experience that I got. It just really showed how much my grandpa was a different person around us, and how genuine and caring he was, and how much he loved us, and. Um, it was like a very nice first, but it also was the last of a lot of things. It was like the last time, it was my first time to um, make chili with my grandma, with my grandpa there. It was the last time I got to watch a Star Trek marathon. Um, it was the last time that um, I got to sit on that recliner and watch television with him while eating some delicious chili. And it was the last time I could say that I got to see my grandmother that happy with my grandpa. Um, because homie passed away in 2013.
I will always appreciate that moment from him and that the joy of those experiences will always be very lively in my little soul because I'm going to let you guys know, Lil Salem was thriving right here telling this story. And, um, and I appreciate being able to share this story with you guys because it really gets to show the caring and loving side of my grandpa. And thank you very much. Rest in peace, grandpa. Love you. Thank you, Salem, for that story. And thank you, all parents and grandparents, for loving us through our favorite foods. Our final story comes from Cristina Chacon, who's the chief amplifier at Yebo. Cristina is an educator and the administrative leader of the team. And she has a story for us about the small moments she shares with her dad among the chaos of home and the world. Thank you. I have always had a close relationship with my dad. I recall endless moments of him telling me his stories growing up in Mexico, stories of his life as a musician, and stories about a new life in the States. Through storytelling, I became very close to him. I was a sidekick, and he took me everywhere. Whether it was a quick run to King Supers or a trip to the mountains to collect rocks for our garden, I'm not sure if that was okay. Uh, we were always together because of our closeness. I wasn't surprised when he asked me to cut his hair earlier this year. I was more surprised that he would trust me with his hair since I don't let anyone near my hair unless it's my hairstylist of many years. He said he wouldn't be too upset if I messed up. The first time I cut his hair, it was a warm summer afternoon in August. We decided to cut his hair outside because my mom would feel so much better about hairs being outside than inside of the house, even though she would gladly vacuum Luna's hair, my little sister's dog, all day, every day. My dad started to tell me the number of blades his hairstylist would use. He said something about a six at the top and a three at the bottom. I was like, I have no idea what that means, but I guess I will sure find out. I took the first razor blade and started to buzz his hair. I wasn't so afraid to the extent that my hands were shaking. However, I was in my head about it, and I could feel my jaw clench. What I was really afraid of was that I was just going to shave off a bald spot. But my dad kept reassuring me, it's okay if you mess up. It's your first time. I kept my composure and tried to focus one buzz at a time. My sister Jessica was sitting next to us, and I recall she looking over and saying, hmm, it looks good, giving me a little bit of reassurance. After an hour and 15 minutes, <laughs> I know, it was a long time, I finally finished. I know it would have taken half the time to have gone to a hairstylist. And also, I'm proud to say that he looked really good. I did have some skills, so when he asked me to do it the second time, I didn't shy away from doing it. And this time, it was more natural, and I was in my element. Just last month, I cut my dad's hair for the third time. However, this time it was different, since the weather was changing. We had to cut his hair inside, and y'all know how my mom feels about hairs inside of the house. So she tucked us away in the stairwell, this little spot, literally two by two feet. Even though it was a smaller space, it didn't matter. I was comfortable enough in my technique to cut my dad's hair. I actually even got to engage with him differently than I had the first two times. I asked him to tell me about one of his musician stories. He started to tell me about a time when he was 19 years old. I'd already heard the story, but I pretended it was my first time. He had just arrived in Ciudad Juarez and decided that he wanted professional photography shots as a musician to take with him, Al Norte. He told me that his accordion has been his loyal companion for the past 60 years. He had his accordion with him and a small suitcase. That's it. One of my favorite songs that he plays and sings while on the accordion is Un Ricosito en el Cielo by Ramon Ayala. Un rinconcito en el cielo, juntos unidos los dos. Y cuando caiga la noche, te daré mi amor. Sorry, tone deaf, whatever. 
<laughs> the song is about having a little corner in heaven with your true love. I couldn't help but think about having my little piece of heaven with my dad on that stairwell that evening. Amidst all of the craziness that is my beautiful Mexican family, from the loud conversations to the music and the novella in the background to my nieces and nephews, that I could have that peace with my dad. Not peace, but peace. This mundane task of cutting my dad's hair made me realize what a beautiful life he has carried. Every gray hair is a different story of years past. It made me love him and cherish him that much more. Thank you. Thank you, Yebo, for sharing your stories with us. Godwin, Bella, Salem, Cristina, and to everyone at Yebo for receiving us into your space to listen. Corey, Isaura, Jaden, Mino, and Mari. Hey, yo! Since working with us, Yebo has outlined big new plans for their future, all centered around storytelling. I can't wait to see and hear all the new stuff they're cooking up. To find out more about Yebo and their podcasts, visit them at yebomedia.org. That's Y-E-B-O media.org. Next time, we'll bring you more stories from another community in Colorado. My Story So Far is a show that collects first-person stories from hidden communities across Colorado. If your community has stories to share, let us know. Find us at cpr.org slash community audio. This show is produced by me and Emily Williams. Our editor is Joe Erickson. You can find a list of everyone who works on My Story So Far in the show notes. For Colorado Public Radio, I'm Luis Antonio Perez. Hi, my name's Emily Williams. I'm a producer on My Story So Far and part of a big team that helps make the podcast. A lot of the stories you hear in this show are people sharing their experiences on stage for the first time ever. If you want more people to hear this unique podcast built around first-person stories from communities around Colorado, you can help us out right now. Please rate the show on your favorite podcast app or write a review. It helps other people discover my story so far. Thanks for listening and supporting podcasts from Colorado Public Radio.